sou João Carvalho Dias, sou diretor adjunto do Museu Carlos Clubenquian e co-comissário da exposição Faraós Superstars. A exposição resulta de uma colaboração com o MUSEM, Musée des Civilisations de la Méditerranée, de Marselha, e conta com múltiplos emprestadores, entre os quais uh, salientamos o Museu de Luva, o Beach Museum, o Ashmolean e muitas outras entidades uh, nacionais e internacionais. A exposição centra-se na figura do faraó, o faraó como sujeito, este homem ou mulher que vai percorrendo o tempo e que uh, a sua memória vai deixando rasto, rasto na paisagem, nos monumentos, uh, na uh, iconografia. A exposição tenta, de alguma forma, seguir este percurso. E um percurso cronológico que leva desde a história do Antigo Egito, há 5 mil anos atrás, até à contemporaneidade. A forma como os faraós são vistos ao longo da história, pelos artistas, pela sociedade dos vários tempos. Não podemos esquecer que todo, toda esta exposição, apesar de se entrar na, na figura do faraó, tem a figura também de Carlos Kulbenkian, colecionador de antiguidades egípcias, que reuniu um considerável conjunto de obras desde 1907 até mais ou menos 1942 e que podem ser vistos no Museu Gulbenkian. Convidámos para falar connosco na galeria da exposição Faraós Superstars a investigadora em estudos culturais Sara Nagati e que também é curadora independente. O facto de ser egípcia permite-lhe uma abordagem particular sobre o papel dos faraós no Egito contemporâneo. I'm very curious about your background in terms of your academic life in Egypt because I'm, I'm always kind of um, wondering about how history uh, is conveyed in uh, Egyptian schools in terms of what you learn. How relevant is this background of Egyptian rule and pharaohs? Does it play a role, a significant role, after you leave school? So... In schools in Egypt, we study Egyptian history, probably like everywhere else in the world. <laughs> and so in terms of dynasties, discoveries, scientific discoveries, progress, things that were done or achieved by the pharaohs. But I think we lose that kind of connection after we finish formal education. However, any connection or discussing any relation we may have to ancient Egypt brings us back to this issue of Egyptian identity. And discussing any identity is a complex question in general. But discussing Egyptian identity also brings with it the question of identity for whom? Because there are many, there are diverse layers of the Egyptian society. Each group of people identify with a certain form of identity, which they find the most, uh, the one they relate to the most on the individual and the collective level. Mm -hmm. and so is, is it difficult to kind of identify a golden age of Egyptian history? Because for, um, for Europeans, um, because uh, Egyptian ancient history is such a long period of time, sort of occupies in our kind of backgrounds this kind of utopian, um, extraordinary um, magic um, and it fulfills the imagination of, of all of us. I don't think this is probably something that uh, Egyptians, more than Egyptians, contemporary Egyptians probably identify with. The Golden Age is definitely the time of ancient Egypt. But whether people see themselves or, or see ancient Egypt as um, directly linked to their modern identity. That's a different question. So that link to their modern identity, because there are because the, the, the civilization that has a deeper, uh, more comprehensive impact on modern Egypt is the Arab Islamic civilization. So we also have that. It depends on, on what, what has more influence. So people of a more, um, people who adopt an, an Islamist background would think a Muslim first, maybe Arab second, mm -hmm. uh, or Egyptian second. People who um, 
during the time of President Nasser in the 50s and the 60s, there was an emphasis on being Arab, yeah. pan-Arabism. Mm -hmm. Only in 1919 did people, with the revolution of 1919 against British occupation, did people feel we are Egyptian and the slogan of Egypt for Egyptian was highly emphasized. Mm -hmm. So it fluctuates with time yes. and this kind of tendency yeah. to feel Egyptian or not changed. Yeah. Uh, another thing which uh, puzzles me is that um, when living in a, in, a, in a place, a country, um, with so overwhelming um, uh, objects in the landscape, um, not, I'm not only referring to pyramids, but to those colossal, are overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> those colossal <laughs> statues scattering the desert and, uh, and invading, or, or uh, the other way around, nowadays uh, the cities are invaded, their, prime, uh, their, their spaces. How do you feel uh, that they can connect to modern Egypt? I think Egypt has always been this collage. It, this collage manifests itself not only in the very prominent ways that we see um, monuments that coexist mm -hmm. with um, very state-of-the-art kind mm -hmm. of yeah. architectural mm -hmm. uh, wonders, but also that in ancient Egypt somehow has an impact in very nuanced ways of, of living. Uh, for example, um, our Arabic Egyptian dialect has some impact from the ancient Egyptian language. Mm -hmm. the, the Coptic language in which, the, in which rituals take yes. place in, yeah. in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, the agriculture and irrigation uh, tools are uh, very similar to what ancient Egyptians. So somehow this has always been harmoniously and I would say harmoniously in a way, but sometimes it's not that it has been conflict free either coexisted throughout Egypt's history. But I would say that this question that you asked is very relevant now because it has been, uh, it rose to the surface the last few years in Egypt because interest has been growing um, in this heritage, in the monuments that we have. And probably a good example would be the Parade of the Mummies um, Mm -hmm. last year in 2021 yes. and the whole world probably saw it uh, on TV where around 22 mummies were taken from one museum to the other in this uh, spectacular parade and yes it looked beautiful to watch but what is probably more interesting is the reactions and the, um, and the debate that, that mm -hmm. it, it triggered. Mm -hmm. How do, we, how do we come to terms with all of that? We live with this history. We have this legacy. We have this heritage. Again, even though we are more strongly connected to the Arab uh, Islamic civilization, we mm -hmm. always find ourselves revising this connection to ancient Egypt. It's there, it's present, it's powerful. It draws the attention of the whole world to Egypt and we keep going back yeah. to it somehow. It's inevitable. Yeah, it's inevitable. As you say, it's powerful and it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, the fact that you cannot not avoid it, you know, you can't erase it. Um, and especially because um, of tourism, because tourism obviously plays a very important role in the preservation of antiquities mm -hmm. because it's, um, it's a source of revenue for millions of people that travel to Egypt to see these ancient glories. Um, but at the same time, I believe it poses some questions, even in terms of um, modern architecture. Um, I, I can perhaps relate to Rome, where there are so many places where you cannot build a modern uh, edifice, you know, because you're always, um, you know, disturbing the past. So this is something that um, contemporary society has to deal with, you know, this past always imposing on you. How can you cope with this past? Actually, I will tell you two things in relation to that. Do you know that it's not uncommon in Egypt to just, if you dig a little bit, especially in some <laughs> neighborhoods <laughs> underneath your house, you to, find, find to find something? Yeah. Some people made a lot of money out of that. <laughs> so that's one. The other thing is, um, I think it's neither burdening nor, um, nor a matter of no, nor does it always manifest itself as something to take advantage of because it doesn't, it doesn't, because it doesn't always coincide with the right historical moment. Mm -hmm. 
But I tell you what it often is, it sometimes fills in a gap in history mm -hmm. for us. And a very good example was in 2011, in uh, the revolution of the 25th of January 2011, mm -hmm. or what is known as the Arab Spring. When, I mean, this might be a minor example, but it was um, very telling. It was unheard of in Egypt to find street art, especially on a big scale during the time of Mubarak. They, they wouldn't allow it, they wouldn't have allowed it. And during the revolution, after the revolution, we saw flourishing of street art and particularly graffiti. A lot of that graffiti used and incorporated references and symbols from ancient Egypt. Many of them were feminist graffiti like that one. Yeah. <laughs> and. This graffiti is a tribute to women's role in the revolution. We see Nefertiti wearing a, a gas mask, and it's by an anonymous artist. He calls himself a Zift. And it's just, it's very difficult to pass by this graffiti and not just be taken aback because it is Nefertiti <laughs> wearing a gas mask yes. and with a defiant look. Mm -hmm. Just how, how could anyone not notice it and that is a moment that where where there was a revolutionary change and revolutionary change seeks a rupture from a present that is deemed oppressive that needs to be corrected however to rupture from a present that kind of leaves a vacuum a gap there emerges a need for a continuity with, a, with something. Mm -hmm. Somehow we need to render the, um, the existing temporality intelligible. We need to make sense. People did it in different ways of filling in this gap. And going back to ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptian symbols and references, as it manifested itself through graffiti, was one of those mm -hmm. ways. That's why we see uh, trying to trace this attempt to trace an origin or a root for uh, Egyptian women. So the oppressive reality of Egyptian women that we aimed to liberate ourselves from through the revolution is juxtaposed with uh, tracing a different story of origins that we belong to this line of Egyptian queens. Mm -hmm. And Nefertiti is not just this icon of beauty, she's no. also yeah. an icon of revolution yes. with Akhnaton. She's this icon of revolution as well. Yes. And there is a, something there to, to trace, to, mm -hmm. to belong to, yes. to create a connection to. That also makes me uh, wonder about these icons and how they have lived so many years and they still find expression in the walls of, um, of, uh, of Cairo, Alexandria, or other towns in, in Egypt. Not only in Egypt, but all over the world. If you see an image like this, you immediately recognize the icon be behind it. So, how did they survive? What's the magic of it? You know, it's, uh, I know this is perhaps <laughs> a, a, more for an historian, <laughs> but I, I think for a sociologist it's really important to, to reflect on these things as well. You know, it's, uh... I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a culmination or, a, or a, it's the coming together of different factors. It somehow fulfills an archetype. So it came to fulfill somehow this archetype or idea of a strong woman and, and somehow the, 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 I wouldn't say a myth because <laughs> Nefertiti did exist, yes. but it became, or, or, or the, the, the whole, the, the stories that have been uh, repeated and circulated around Nefertiti over how many years, <laughs> have gained their weight and have deepened people's understanding of other stories, other narratives, other grand narratives as well. They, they have an archetypical function as well. And in Egypt in particular, I would say, and that, that is probably <laughs> what I would know more about, is that they, they fill in a gap of the idea that Egyptian women tend to be stronger than generally portrayed. And they know this kind of strength because of the everyday life challenges they go through. Mm -hmm. But due to the, conserv the general conservative situation of society, this kind of, this is pushed back. 
And there is a need to seek different examples of history to, to, to show and highlight and, and, and project on them this strength and this glory and this uh, great story of origin and those roots and just put, put these, these examples up and elevate them and, and show that, well, these are the Egyptian women, we are those women, or we belong to those examples, or these are, we are the granddaughters of Nefertiti, that's more or less what, because it's, uh, this documentary that has been done about this graffiti and other ones called, the feminist um, graffiti called Nefertiti's Daughters kind of pop icons uh, such as Rihanna and uh, Beyonce have also used this kind of iconography. I'm thinking about two items that, that are on this, in this exhibition. Uh, Rihanna's photo for Arab um, Vogue in which she pretends to be <laughs> Nefertiti or um, the, um, the seal or the logo of Beyonce um, which uses different uh, um, uh, elements uh, like the, 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 the fist for Black Power, the Black Panther, um, but also a profile uh, Nefertiti. Um, how do you feel about their use of this um, iconography for their own use or for just conveying a message? The thing is, even with this graffiti that I like a lot <laughs> and wrote about, I still feel that it is something that rather conveys a sense of being stuck in time, that Nefertiti here does not necessarily convey a sense of, um, oh, it doesn't stand for women liberation because it, an average Egyptian woman wouldn't necessarily find an inspiration mm -hmm. um, that would make or break her everyday struggles mm -hmm. uh, in Nefertiti wearing uh, a gas mask, even though it's very, uh, very telling and very beautiful and I like it. So I would say that I'm even further remote mm -hmm. from that form of, of, of representation mm -hmm presented by Rihanna or, or Beyonce. Um, of course, they, they, they get to, to, to choose the, 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 their own model of, of feminism that, mm -hmm. that draws on a pop icon or, or, I mean, in this case, the pop icon is Nefertiti <laughs> <laughs> in this case. So mm -hmm. they, they, can, they can do that and they can um, present that in whichever way they, they, they prefer. But I'm not sure that this is something many women can actually relate to, that it goes far enough, um, that it goes deep enough, not only because Nefertiti is a figure far away in history that would make the everyday struggles of any woman, mm -hmm. but also because I think they, the way they use and, and incorporate Nefertiti in their art is just uh, doesn't, doesn't really make use of that in a, in a way that is just deep enough. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't, let's, let's put it that way, it doesn't radicalize the women questions enough. Yeah. That's for me, that for me is the issue. So I feel that it's Nefertiti and it's like the idea we're strong, we're powerful, powerful and we're mm -hmm. beautiful, but it stops here. But then women with real problems in the world need more and will probably not relate enough. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. so for me it doesn't go far enough, mm -hmm. looks nice, good for them, but doesn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs>